On the 1st of June of this year, in anticipation of our unit's gradual resumption of normal operations, our Chief Dental Officer released his third interim directive since the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic. This directive summarized the risk mitigation measures to be adopted by all of our personnel, military and civilian, when operating on our facilities, and modified previous protocols in the light of new evidence and guidelines from diverse sources. Among other information, this directive provided guidance with respect to the engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment, or PPE, that have been introduced in the wake of the pandemic. The following set of videos is intended as a training tool, providing a visual demonstration and summary of most of the measures described. These videos are a modification of a previous set of PPE videos released by Detachment Borden in conjunction with a webinar hosted in early May that remains available online. We've produced a new set of videos in order to reflect the changes introduced in the most recent directive with respect to previous direction. However, given the scarcity of certain items of PPE, N95 respirators and gowns for instance, we have decided not to re-record all footage with a view to preserving our resources. Instead, where necessary, we will indicate by narration any significant differences between current protocols and those depicted. As before, our goal is simply to walk the viewer through the unit's current approach to patient treatment and management, beginning with patient reception and proceeding through operatory setup, air filtration units, selection, donning and doffing of PPE, treatment procedures, and cleaning and disinfection. There have been few changes concerning patient reception since the release of our previous videos. As before, patients are screened initially by our medical colleagues with respect to their risk of transmitting the virus before being permitted to enter the building. Those patients deemed to be at risk will be evaluated by a medical officer and potentially directed to self-isolate. Again, patients should arrive having recently completed the hand hygiene and having donned a protective mask. But we retain our hygiene and masking station where patients will repeat hand hygiene and don a mask if not already wearing one. Our distancing policies also remain the same, which is to say patients are expected to respect a 2 meters distance with our personnel and each other and to observe a no-touch or minimal-touch policy when in our facilities. These policies are indicated by prominently placed signage. Physical distancing and touch contamination are minimized by removing all unnecessary items from the reception area and directing the patient promptly to the operatory. A plexiglass barrier protecting our staff remains in place and we continue to screen our patients concerning both their relative risk of transmitting the virus and the acuity of their condition before greeting the patient directly. We continue to take patient temperature before carrying on with treatment and will not see a patient whose temperature exceeds 38 degrees Celsius. Our personnel will be protected by eye protection and a mask and will complete hand hygiene before doing so. As for the changes, we no longer keep our door locked and allow patients to self-direct to the detachment. All the same, we do attempt remote triage by telephone when our duty team is contacted by telephone. Our patients and our non-clinical personnel will likely be wearing an issued reusable cloth mask versus a surgical mask, but cloth masks must be changed as soon as possible when damp or dirty and replaced with a type 1 mask. You will note in the video to follow that we've placed floor markings delineating necessary distance, and you will note that a reception area now accommodates 6 versus 2 patients, though there are 2 meters between seats to facilitate distancing. Our protocol outside working hours remains essentially unchanged, save for the possibility of completing essential dental care in addition to urgent and emergent care and the substitution where possible of a cloth mask for a type 1 mask. This video will quickly summarize patient reception in the COVID-19 environment. Our patient here will self-direct to the clinic protected with an issued mask. In all D&D workplaces, a mask is worn where 2 meters distance cannot be respected at all times. But the mask must be exchanged if soiled or damp for a type 1 mask, and type 1 masks should be exchanged themselves every 4 hours at a minimum. Eye protection is also highly recommended. Our patient alerts our reception staff of her presence. Our staff are protected by a plexiglass barrier. She will then be screened for the questions in the CDO's directive, and if cleared, our reception staff will take the patient's temperature protected by an issued mask and safety glasses. We continue to use an infrared thermometer for minimal patient contact, provided the patient is not febrile, she's directed to take a seat or preferably is here conveyed directly to the operatory. Note that the reception area is now arranged to accommodate more members, but there are still two meters between chairs. You'll note that our clinical providers are themselves protected by mask and glasses and will respect physical distance while directing the patient to the operatory. Outside working hours, we continue to receive our patients at our rear staff entrance where the vestibule permits us to maximize physical distance. A wash basin and soap and a cart with an alcohol-based hand rub and a type 1 mask remains available. The patient carries out hand hygiene, dons a mask if she's not already wearing one, and repeats hand hygiene. Her temperature will then be taken, and if confirmed afebrile, the member will be escorted at the appropriate physical distance to the reception area. Again, note that her providers will be protected by a type 1 mask or an issued mask and safety glasses.
Dentistry is among the highest risk healthcare fields for the transmission of this virus, so it follows that appropriate measures must be established to protect our people. One critical element of this protection is the correct selection and use of personal protective equipment or PPE. The most recent directive saw significant changes concerning our use of PPE and represents a potential point of confusion for many. The change is the product of continuous consultation or research, however. The directive will continue to evolve based on emerging scientific evidence and guidelines from various public health authorities. As before, selection of PPE will be driven by the patient's relative risk of carrying COVID-19 and whether the planned procedure is an aerosol-generating procedure or a non-aerosol-generating procedure. The protocols are summarized in Annexes B and C of the CDO's most recent interim directive, pictured here. There are a number of changes introduced in the new document. Masks. Either ASTM Level 2 or Level 3 are permitted versus Level 3 alone. Gowns. Gowns are not required for low-risk treatment without rotary instrumentation, and any level of gown is permitted for low-risk rotary instrumentation, whereas Level 1 or 2 gowns were required previously. Level 1 or 2 gowns may be used for high-risk treatment, whereas Level 3 or 4 were required previously. Selection of Level 1 versus 2 is determined by the amount of water spray anticipated. Gloves. Surgical gloves, whether the treatment is in question is high or low risk, are only required for aseptic procedures. Examination gloves can be used for all other high-risk procedures. Hand hygiene. Providers must now complete both hand and forearm hygiene, whereas only hand hygiene was described previously. Again, we have arranged all of our PPE in a dedicated bay with conspicuously placed ed memoirs before. We have moved our PPE bay to an unused radiography bay, which frees up operatories for patient treatment, and, because this is a closed-door room, isolates material from particulate. We have placed diagrams illustrating the three dress dates described in our most recent instruction on the wall, in addition to enlarged versions of the annexes. Here we have illustrated the dress date for non-rotary low-risk procedures, such as exams and consultations. Note the sequence. And here we have the sequence for low-risk treatment that includes rotary instrumentation. Again, taking note of the sequence. And finally, here is the PP and sequence for high-risk treatment. There are also significant changes in the doffing of PPE. We are still equipped with a doffing station in the high-risk phase. However, because high-risk treatment can now be completed in both open and closed operatories, the second doffing phase, that which takes place after exiting the closed operatory, now occurs in the operatory opposite the PPE bay. We've established this central area for the doffing of reusable PPE for simplification. Additionally, whereas in the videos to follow, the bonnet and face shield are removed in the closed operatory, providers will now continue to wear a face shield when exiting the bay and will remove this in the secondary central doffing station. We acknowledge that the entirely new video is demonstrating the many changes described would be useful to many. However, as mentioned in our introduction, we thought it prudent to preserve our resources to the greatest extent possible given the scarcity of PPE, and believe the following videos will remain a useful instructional tool. And now we present a video that touches on the central topic of today's discussion, transmission-driven personal protective equipment. We'll touch first on the sequence for donning low-risk and then high-risk PPE. As discussed earlier, we've established a dedicated PPE bay at Det Borden, which provides a dedicated area for donning PPE some distance away from the areas where we generate aerosolized particles. As you can see, we've arranged our PPE in the sequence in which items are donned, with aid memoirs placed conspicuously to guide our personnel. Our detachment, as do others, perform quarterly hygiene audits, so we expect that our hand hygiene technique is sound. All the same, we've placed guides to hygiene with both an alcohol-based hand rub and soap and water at the sink. Sanitizer does effectively kill the virus, but it's recommended that proper hand washing with soap and water be substituted for sanitizer approximately every three washes, or if the hands are visibly soiled. We begin with the sequence for low-risk PPE. Gowns serve to protect both skin and clothing, and should cover both. The gown should cover both the front and back of the torso, extending to at least the knees, and fitting comfortably over the body with long sleeves that are fitted at the wrists. Goggles should fit snugly over and around the eyes. It's not acceptable to substitute one's personal glasses for goggles, and the goggles selected need to be side vented. 
Once mask and goggles are in place, it's essential to limit any opportunities for touch contamination. Don't touch your face or touch PPE with contaminated gloves, it can be helped. Remember to perform hand hygiene again before donning your gloves. Ensure that the sleeve of the glove is fitted over the sleeve of the gown. Once both members of the duty team are suited for battle, we conduct a buddy check to ensure that everything has been placed correctly. And now we demonstrate the sequence for high-risk PPE. You'll note that our duty team has already completed hand hygiene, placed booties, and is now hand washing again. They will now don a type 3 surgical gown. Please note that subsequently in this video, one of our providers will don a surgical mask, vice, and N95 mask, as we wanted to minimize the number of masks used in the production of this presentation. Both providers must wear an N95 mask if it is anticipated that aerosols will be generated. Note that Captain Lee verifies that the N95 is correctly sized before donning the mask. You will note the placement of the straps, that they are not crisscrossed. You will note that he molds the mask to his face and having done so, conducts a fit test. Our providers will next don goggles, a bonnet, and a face shield. The face shield needs to extend inferiorly over the chin and laterally beyond the angle of the mandible. Surgical gloves will be used in lieu of examination gloves for high-risk procedures. Again, ensure that the sleeve of the glove is fitted over the sleeve of the gown. Again, we execute a buddy check before proceeding to the operatory. This next sequence will see our treatment complete and a provider prepared to remove PPE. Our provider moves first to the doffing station adjacent to the door, where an aid memoir will guide removal of personal protective equipment. As you can see, booties are removed first with gloved hands. Following this, with gloves still on, the gown and gloves are removed simultaneously if possible. Following removal of these contaminated items, hand hygiene is repeated. Now our provider will remove the bonnet and the face shield. You'll want to remember to grasp the rear of the bonnet and the strap of the face shield, as these are the relatively clean surfaces of these items of PPE. Before opening the door, hand hygiene is repeated. And it's important to remember to close the door behind you to contain any suspended viral particles. Our provider has moved to the secondary doffing station where hand hygiene is repeated. Eye protection is removed by the straps, not the facial aspect, and placed in the disinfection bin as these are intended for your use. The N95 is removed by the straps and not the facial aspect of the mask as the member does here. Hand hygiene is repeated and a type one mask is donned. We will now discuss operatory setup in the COVID-19 environment with an emphasis on the air filtration units recently introduced into our practice. Operatory setup, whether in enclosed or open operatories, entails the removal of any unessential equipment or material, as is depicted here, to facilitate disinfection. Additionally, any peripherals remaining in the room must be covered with the barrier. You'll note that we place a barrier over the hose of the air filtration unit as the corrugated surface of this component and the material of which it's constructed render it a little more difficult to thoroughly clean and disinfect. Procedures and setup should be as well planned as is reasonably possible, particularly where high risk treatment is involved, so that all required equipment is present in the room before treatment commences. This minimizes movement of the providers and patient once treatment is commenced, as in enclosed operatories, the doors should remain closed throughout the procedure. For the same reason, if available, the mobile radiography unit should be also present in closed operatories, though panoramic radiographs should be used in lieu of intraoral radiographs where possible. If something unanticipated is required or something was forgotten, we keep a baby monitor in the closed bays. During typical working hours, there's a roaming dental technician who will carry with them the other member of the pair. This allows the chairside dental tech or dental officer to request the item, eliminating the need to replace PPE and leave the room. 
Note that adjacent open operatories should not be used simultaneously when an aerosol generating procedure is occurring, though the operatory adjacent to an operatory in use may be used immediately after the procedure ends without the need to disinfect the surfaces of that operatory. Among the engineering controls established to mitigate the risk of disease transmission are air filtration units, or AFUs. These devices serve to reduce the concentration of airborne particulate to pretreatment levels. As has been emphasized elsewhere, these units are only effective in closed operatories, do not give license to freely generate aerosols, and still require that every effort be taken to avoid or minimize the generation of aerosols in our current environment. AFUs must also be supplemented with the competent use of high-volume evacuation, another key method of capturing aerosolized particles. We use two portable AFUs during aerosol generating treatment, a chair-side AFU and an ambient AFU, both of which use HEPA filtration. The chair-side unit serves to capture the majority of particles generated at the source, whereas the ambient unit serves to capture the remaining particles in the ambient air. As is depicted in the schematic from Annex H of the CDO's most recent directive, the chair-side AFU is placed on the dentist's side with the funnel positioned such that the top of the nozzle is no more than 20 centimeters from the patient's nose and the bottom within 1 to 2 centimeters of the patient's chin. The ambient unit is placed at the patient's feet and the exhaust fans are pointed upward. You may find that the hose tends to droop and fall out of position. If this is the case, you can shorten the hose by removing some of the rings underneath. Do not cut the hose, however. You may also find that the hose tends to come loose from the base. If this is the case, consider reinforcing the hose with a hose clamp and or duct tape. Whereas the chair-side AFU is turned off between patients, the ambient AFU should be continuously operational on days in which the closed operatory is active and turned off 30 minutes following the last patient. After aerosol generating procedures, both AFUs must continue to run for a full 10 minutes after the final aerosol is generated before removing PPE and leaving the room. During this time, rubber dam can be removed, post-operative instructions given, and initial tidy-up commenced. Cleaning and disinfection of AFUs will be discussed later in this presentation. And now a brief summary of the key points concerning operatory setup. Firstly, whether you're treating members in closed or open settings, ensure that all non-essential equipment has been removed from the operatory to facilitate disinfection. All remaining peripherals should then be protected with a barrier. Plan your procedures well in advance and do your best to ensure that you anticipate all of your equipment needs beforehand particularly where high risk treatment is concerned, so that there's no reason to leave the room. If you're operating in a closed operatory, ensure that baby monitors and our walkie-talkies are functional so that if you have forgotten something, it can be obtained without leaving the room. Ensure that your intraoral radiography equipment is available. Ensure that your donning and doffing stations have all required materials, such as a garbage bag and a bin for reusable PPE. Ensure that there is a small cup with peroxide mouth rinse, a few sheets of Kleenex, and a Ziploc bag on the tray table. Ensure that both of your AFUs are operating at the highest setting beforehand. When the patient arrives, position the AFU such that the nozzle is no more than 20 centimeters from the patient's nose and no more than 1 to 2 centimeters from their chin. If your patient is undergoing both a sterile and high-risk procedure, it will be necessary for the dental technician to first set the AFU using examination gloves and subsequently change into sterile gloves after repeating hand hygiene. It will not be necessary to repeat form hygiene, as is depicted here, because presumably this will have previously been done. It will, however, be necessary to have sterile gloves available in the bay. We'll now review all the procedures undertaken before, during, and following treatment. Patients undergoing high-risk treatment will wear a type 1 gown, as depicted here. However, given the fluctuating scarcity of certain items of PPE, it is also permissible to protect the member with plastic or other fluid barriers. Before all treatment, patients will remove their mask and rinse with a peroxide mouth rinse. To mitigate infective risk, as you will see here, the patient expectorates the excess into the cup, absorbs the excess with Kleenex, seals the waste in a Ziploc bag, and disposes of the waste in the garbage before treatment. When hygiene is complete, the patient will remove her PPE and off her gown, repeat hand hygiene, and don a mask. During working hours, she will be advised to directly exit the building, whereas outside working hours, she will be advised to wait for our personnel in the reception area. Once personnel have removed their PPE, the member will be escorted at an appropriate physical distance to the exit. 
Remember during treatment to minimize the use of rotary instrumentation, intraoral radiographs, and three ray syringes, and to avoid ultrasonic instrumentation such as Cavitron altogether. Remember that AGPs may now be performed in open operatories, but only where treatment can be performed under rubber dam isolation. To ensure the personnel do not enter the bay once high risk treatment is commenced, this signage is placed on the door of closed bays. Subsequently, this signage used stand in indicate when the room can safely be entered for disinfection. If high risk treatment is underway in open operatories, we place the same signage on either side of the bay in use, which prevents personnel from entering the treatment space and warns against using the adjacent operatories when treatment is underway. And now we'll move on to the topic of cleaning and disinfection. Firstly, remember to wait the necessary period of time before proceeding with disinfection. This information is obtained in Annex B of the CDO's most recent directive. After low-risk treatment, disinfection can proceed immediately. After high-risk treatment in an open operatory, three hours must first pass before beginning disinfection. After high-risk treatment in an enclosed operatory without air filtration, again, three hours must elapse. And after high-risk treatment in an enclosed operatory with air filtration, 30 minutes, including the 10-minute wait period, must elapse. Again, as illustrated in Annex B of the CDO's most recent directive, PPE for disinfection consists simply of examination utility gloves, level 1 mask, and eye protection. The intermediate level of surface disinfectants that we typically use are effective against the virus, but remember to ensure the manufacturer's recommended contact time. In the case of Optima 33TB, which is used in Borden, a 1 minute contact is required. Optima is a hydrogen peroxide based solution, so remember that this can degrade plastic surfaces and they may need to be cleaned after disinfection. Peripherals will be removed first. Then all exposed treatment surfaces of the operatory are thoroughly cleaned of debris and disinfected with an appropriate intermediate level surface disinfected. This includes all surfaces of the dental chair unit, operator and assistant stools, countertop surfaces, drawer handles, and anything that was handled or exposed to aerosols whether used or not. The AFUs must be similarly disinfected with an appropriate intermediate level disinfectant, such as Optum 33 TB or Cabicide, again while respecting the indicated contact times. Pay particular attention to the disinfection of the capture arm and nozzle of the chair side AFU, as they'll be more exposed during treatment and may require handling to readjust the position mid-treatment. Because the disinfectant can leave a residue on the transparent plexiglass nozzle, remember to wipe it with a cloth dampened with soap and water after disinfection. Alternatively, this part can be disconnected and submerged in soapy water to thoroughly clean it. Apart from these considerations, follow the typical procedures for sterilization and disinfection paying particularly high attention to high-touch surfaces such as door handles and light switches. In the CSR, instrument reprocessing should follow the usual IPAC measures. If ultrasonic instruments are used, however, they should never be turned on without the cover, and if liquid splashes are anticipated, wear protective clothing with sleeves, such as a fluid-resistant gown.